and what I want to do is very, very briefly introduce myself, very, very briefly introduce the SBR exam, to talk a little bit about exam technique, and to talk a little bit about the conceptual framework, because that underpins everything, it really does. Um, so that's, that, that's how I'm planning on doing it. Now we've got another session ahead. Some of you will join me next Monday, um, particularly those of you in Australia, because on Monday, I'm running the SBR session on CBE that uh, was in the previous slide. Um, but I'm assuming that most of us here are doing the paper-based exam, so that'll be the focus of today's session. But if you are doing the CBE exam, or you want to know about the CBE exam in advance, then I'm doing a webinar with ACCA on Monday. But we have another session that has been lined up, which is on the 18th of August, and that's a much longer session. And I'll be doing some revision there on control to control, cash flow, financial instruments, that kind of thing. So be sure to tune into that, please. So that's a little picture of me, and that's a little bit of a um, introduction of me. One thing that I would say is that I'm on LinkedIn, and I post regularly about SBR, and I blog about SBR on LinkedIn. So if you wanted to connect with me on a professional basis, then please find me on LinkedIn. Yeah, Tom Clendon on LinkedIn. It'll be pretty obvious uh, who I am and uh, I will accept you. No problems with that. So let's talk about the paper. And it's a compulsory exam. Every question has to be done. The first question is group accounts. I caution you. I remind you that it's not P2, that this exam is a written exam, a discursive exam. So the question we're going to get on group accounts is primarily going to be explaining a number. OK, you're not you're not going to have to prepare a full set of accounts. So make sure that you practice group accounts questions that are SBR questions, not old P2 questions. Question two in section A will have an ethical angle to it. So you must know your ethics. It's really key and important. And question three and four are around accounting standards. It's really very applied. It's really very practical. You are going to have to think in the exam on this feet, on, on, on your feet. When you did FR, it was MCQ. When you did FR, you were often tested on the definitions. Here, you're having to write, you're having to explain, you're having to think. So I've got some opportunities for you to demonstrate and practice those skills coming up in a minute. You can see that I've referenced there the, you can see that I've referenced there the conceptual framework. And the conceptual framework, trust me, will be there in the exam. Somewhere in the exam, there will be a reference to the framework. And even if, even if there isn't, you think, a direct reference to the framework, the framework is such a useful tool to be able to answer questions, to, to, to come up with solutions to current issues. So there's a little something about the SBR exam, which sort of tries to sum it up a little bit. Takes your knowledge that you've gained, adds in a few accounting standards, tests it in a practical situation. Yes, there may be some numbers, but it's about judgment. It's about understanding the principles. You are training to become a professional. You are training to become a qualified, chartered, certified accountant. You are not practicing to become Google. A client will not walk into your office and say, what is the definition of impairment? A client will walk into your office and, and, and present you with a practical problem. And you will then have to identify that it's impairment that needs to, there's an impairment review that needs to be undertaken. So it is important that we think, it is important that we reflect. And that's gonna come out now in my next phase. So I've introduced myself, I've introduced the exam, 
and now I'm about to talk about the exam technique. I'm just going to pause for a moment in case there are any questions about the exam itself and the structure of the exam that anybody has. I'm not going to pause for long. So if you do want to ask a question on anything that I have said so far, you have to be pretty quick off the mark. But there are no such questions. Uh, there are no such questions coming through. Uh, yes, you will get the presentation slides after this. Yeah. OK. All right. You still want to see my lovely face. That's fair enough. OK, so top tips for tackling the paper. Top tips for tackling the paper. Fail to prepare and prepare to fail. Well, you're logging in today, so you're taking one of the necessary steps to be properly prepared for this exam. It is dispiriting sometimes for the markers and for the tutors, sometimes to see students not taking their studies as seriously as perhaps they might. And they, the students therefore let themselves down. This is a professional exam. For some of you, this will be your first professional exam. You are gonna to have to take it seriously. Some of you may have taken this paper before and therefore are fully aware of the demands of passing this paper. So let's have a look at each of these in turn. We're going to talk about RTQ. We're going to think about one mark. We're going to think about application. We're going to think about time versus knowledge. So here I am in uh, La, La Passat, I think it is, in um, Singapore with my friend Marty and my friend William. Uh, back in the day when I used to uh, live in Southeast Asia and, and, and travel around. But uh, as I say, I'm back in the UK now. And in fact, at the moment, I'm in Scotland. I'm in the Highlands of Scotland. My wife is Scottish. And uh, that's why we're here. We're just here on holiday, but uh, she's upstairs asleep because with the time difference, it's uh, early in the morning. But anyway, I'm here with you, which is where I want to be. What do I mean by RTQ? RTQ stands for read the question. Because if we're going to answer the question, the information that is within the question is a massive signpost, is a massive clue. And I think sometimes students can struggle because they don't fully pick up the clues. They're not a good enough Sherlock Holmes and they don't understand the information they've been given. They have the knowledge. It's all there. They have the knowledge. But you have to unlock that knowledge and apply. So I want to tease you, I want to test you about reading the question because it's so important. Chat box. If you are told the asset is damaged, now I want the name of the standard rather than the number of the standard. Which accounting standard, which, 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 which accounting treatment springs to mind? Fantastic. I'm hearing impairment. I love it. I'm hearing impairment. I love it. Thank you. No, thank you, Tiff. Yeah, thank you, Kai. Thank you, Lo. Yeah, thank you, Zhang. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So pretty basic. Yeah, an asset is impaired when the carrying value exceeds the recoverable amount. And if an asset is damaged, that is a clear indicator of impairment. Some of you know that it's ISA 36, some of you don't. I don't actually care. There are no marks, I repeat, no marks in the exam for knowing that it's IAS 36. You can simply say the standard on impairment and that is okay. If you have a non-current asset and management have decided to sell the asset, that is a clue that you should be accessing your brain. You should be thinking about a particular, yes, 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 Tiff, yes, Lim, yes, Alvin, yes, Zian, yes, good. Non-current assets held for sale, yes, IFRS 5, correct. Mandy, spot on. So 
It's a clue, isn't it? It's a clue. No, no uh, uh, Prem, you do not. You do not need to write the words IAS 36 or IFRS 5. What you need to be able to do is to say the standard on impairment. Yeah, yeah, or, or, or is it held for sale? So management decided to sell the asset is a clue to get you to open up the box of held for sale. And there will be other clues within the scenario. So if an asset is to be classified as held for sale, not only has there to be a decision, but there has to be a commitment, an active plan. The asset has to be in a suitable condition for immediate sale. Um, the asset has to be highly probable that it's going to be sold within 12 months. And all of this information um, may be given in the question and you may have to sift it and judge it because you need all of those conditions in place at the year end. And then if it is held for sale, then we're going to be predictive and we're going to uh, uh, show that asset as current assets rather than as non-current assets because it's not going to be there next year. We're going to cease depreciation, do an impairment review, so on and so forth. So it's like a portal. You've, you've, got, to, you've got to use this key to open up and realize that your knowledge has got to pour out. I think there's more than one accounting issue. That if the company has green credentials and has recently put an oil rig in the sea, I think there is more than one accounting issue. What accounting issues occur to you? environmental issue i love it provisions decommissioning provisions decommissioning yeah excellent yeah a little bit of sustainability yeah i mean you could criticize them perhaps for, for for not being sustainable but from a pure accounting purpose um and if you make a provision which you do well, we'll talk about, I'll talk in a minute about if you make, the, what needs needed to make the provision. If you make the provision, what's the other account? Where's the debit? If you make the provision, where's the debit? Is it an immediate expense? Is it the element debits are either assets or expenses? So if you, uh, oh, okay. So Melvin says non-current assets. Susanna says expenses. Christian says, Christine says assets. Okay, all right, let me step back a little bit. Let me just step, step back a little bit. Because we've got green credentials, what effectively we're saying is that we're an environmentally credible oil company, if there is such a thing, if that's not too much of an oxymoron. In other words, what we're saying is that we have issued detailed public announcements that are raising the expectation that we're going to clear up the mess. So bear in mind a provision is a liability of uncertain timing or amount. Bear in mind that um, when you put up an oil rig, there will be a, a, a cost to taking it down and you've committed with your green credentials to take it down. So to make a provision, there has to be a, a, a present that has to be a, a present obligation, legal or constructive, arising from a past event, which um, is probable outflow, capable of relying. Well, sometimes there's a legal requirement to take the oil rig down, but here, because you've got green credentials, there is a there is a constructive obligation that the the green credentials is the creating a valid expectation. And the past event is the installation of the oil rig. As soon as you've done that damage, you become obliged to uh, clear up that damage. Now, therefore, you recognize the liability in full. You recognize, oh, oh, Alvin, thank you. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, and it's absolutely, yes, spot on. So you recognize the vision. You measure it at present value because it's payable in the future in 10 years' time. And the debit is to non-current assets, you capitalize it, because in effect, it's like an installation cost. In order to get the benefit of the oil rig, A, you have to, you have, to have the oil rig, capitalize that cost, B, you have to install it, and C, you have to uninstall it, you have to decommission it. So yeah, you capitalize the decommissioning costs, amortize that over the period, 
and unwind the discount on the liability. Wow. Now, for some of you, that may be FR, but it's the sort of thing that I see coming up again in SBR. And again, there could be some issues around sustainability and accountability on those areas. Fantastic. Right. Now we're getting a little bit heavier. The company has guaranteed a loan taken out by the director. So there's no money changing hands here. The company doesn't have a cash flow at all, but the company has guaranteed a loan taken out by the director. So Ming Kai Chai is coming up with contingent liability. Carolyn is coming up with related party transaction. And you're both correct. This is the joy of SBR, that it's an integrated dynamic scenario that the company guaranteeing a loan taken out by the director is a related party transaction. Even though, ah, oh, yes, IFRS 9 as well. Brilliant, Xiang, brilliant. So we've got three separate accounting standards that I'm gonna have to talk about, yeah, just in one sentence. And obviously in an exam, this is slightly spilt out a little bit more because you might be given the name of the company, the amount of the guarantee, all that kind of thing. So first things first, it's rare in the exam that you will be told you are now about to be tested on related party transactions. It's rare. What you're gonna be given is a transaction with a director or a transaction with a, a subsidiary or a transaction with a major shareholder and you've got to then click, oh, oh, hang on a minute. A director is a, is a member of the key management. Therefore, they are uh, automatically a related party. So disclosure in the notes is the first thing. And that is worth a mark, maybe two marks. Yeah, that you've identified that it's a related, the directors are related parties. And as a result, there must be disclosure in the notes. And if somebody's deliberately not disclosing information in the notes, trying to hide this, then there's an ethical angle around integrity. Secondly, uh, contingent liability, because the company has a potential obligation to pay money out if the director defaults on the loan. Now, I think, I think I'm being reasonable. The chances of the director defaulting on a loan must be slim. 5%, 20%. I mean, it's not probable, is it? It's not, you know, it's not probable that the director is going to, it's not a reasonable thing to say. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's a remote or a possible situation. If it's remote, then under ISA 37 provisions, you're just ignoring it. If you think it's possible, then there would again be a disclosure in the notes. But in a way, there's a disclosure in the notes anyway, um, in respect of the related party. So at this moment in time, there's no debit and there's no credit. But somebody also mentioned IFRS 9. And IFRS 9 is financial instruments. And this is a contract. And the company has guaranteed a loan. And that is a, that is a financial instrument. That is a liability. And financial instruments have to be measured at fair value. Yet the initial recognition of a financial instrument is at fair value. So if the loan is 100 million, say, if the, if the, if the director takes out a personal loan of 100 million, which the company then guarantees, and there is a 5% chance that the director will default, you could argue that the fair value of that company's guarantee is 5 million. And then you would be accounting for that because what you are required to do in this situation is to recognize the higher of the amount under ISA 37 provisions and the amount under IFRS 9. And it's almost certainly going to be the amount under IFRS 9, the fair value. So you end up actually charging, you actually end up recognizing a liability of five. You would end up recognizing something here 
even though there's no cash flow, even though it wouldn't be under ISA 37, under IFRS 9, it's a financial instrument and is a liability. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if an asset is damaged, it's impaired. Yeah, nice and simple. If a company's guaranteed a loan taken out by the director, related party transactions, I say 37, and then you've also got there the, 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 I, uh, the, you know, the fair value of a financial instrument. So three uh, accounting standards or four, if you want to include how you measure fair value. It's not a photograph that I took. Um, but it's somebody there in a peaceful place. Could be in Scotland, couldn't it? Hopefully we're gonna see something like that later today. The company has obtained an interest-free loan from the local government. The company has obtained an interest-free loan from the local government. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good. Oh, yes, government grants. Well done, Vincent. Um, IFRS 9, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's more than one accounting standard, isn't it? How would you measure the financial, how, how would you measure this? If you've obtained a loan, how would you be measuring that loan, that initial recognition of a liability under IFRS 9? It would be made of fair value, wouldn't it? So you, again, you, you can ask it, that's it. Uh, Shab, that's it, Rua. It's 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 a fair value. Yeah, it's a fair value. Good, good. So, can I just step back very briefly for a moment? Um, the company is obtaining, the company is obtaining an interest-free loan from the local government. Now, what that is telling me is that every word in that statement is relevant. It's government, and. I would rather have an interest-free loan than pay 10% on the loan. So there's a financial benefit that I am receiving because it's an interest-free loan. So there is an element there of financial assistance involved. And therefore, government grants, if this loan is given to me to pay wages, if this loan is given to me for operating expenses, then the benefit occurs in the P&L. But if this loan is given to me to help me buy an item of plant or machinery that has a long life, it's a capital grant, and therefore I will have to make sure that that is spread over the period of the loan. So if we imagine the loan is 10 million, for want of a simple number, if we imagine that the loan is a two-year loan, what you would initially do is debit cash 10 million. But your liability would initially be measured at the present value of the future cash flow. So there's a 10 million, um, there's a 10 million uh, uh, debt you take to cash coming in. The credit is a smaller number because the credit is the 10 million at the present value of the future cash flow. And so you'd be have to, if, if numbers were required, they would have to be discounted. So if you were given a discount rate, you could work out that it might be, I don't know, 9 million and therefore effectively, there's a 1 million credit. I understand there's a couple of questions coming in on the Q&A box. I'm not gonna look at the Q&A box during the session, please use the chat box. Um, but the question is correct, that we recognize the, the, the higher of ISA 37 and IFRS uh, 9 in, the, in that situation, and it'd be IFRS 9 that mentions that requirement. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we've got that, and I'm interested in you understanding that there's a benefit to an interest-free loan, that your initial recognition is a fair value, and that you can explain that, all right? Because realistically, if numbers come up, they're easy. If numbers come up, they're supportive. It's your ability to write, yeah? And, you know, this is where, this is where I would love to be able to kind of, you know, come down, the, come down the computer and kind of, you know, mark your work and see your work. But in this format, that's not possible. Other formats, it might be. Right, okay. I suppose this is more to do with question two. 
What's the significance of being told that a finance director is a member of ACCA? Well, let me answer that question for you. If it's in question two, ah, ah, yes, thank you, Prem. Thank you, Prem. Yes, Lim, spot on. Fantastic. Yeah, it is about ethical issues, isn't it? And if you're told that someone is a qualified accountant, of course, you're, 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 they are bound by the ethical code. OPIC, you know, objectivity, professional behavior, professional conduct, integrity, competence, whatever, it, it, uh, confidentiality. The finance director is judged to a higher standard to uphold the ethical code. So it's a, it's a win um, to, do to you identifying uh, what is going on. Yeah, so uh, that's good, that's good. And last but by no means least, in terms of these small silly little questions, last but by no means least, yeah, we have got here a, what do I got? A financial instrument issued to raise finance has been classified as equity. Now that's a strange thing. So no need to jump on the chat box at this stage, just hang on, hang on for a second. I don't know about you, but I'm very cynical. I don't know about you, but I think the examiner has a split personality. The person who writes the exam half the time is a bit of an idiot and half the time is a genius. Now, when I say a bit of an idiot, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm not being insulting. I am saying that they're playing a role, that they're writing an exam question and in the exam question, they're very often playing the fool. They're very often getting the wrong accounting treatment. And I want you to be skeptical. I want you to be professional. I want you to be detached. I want you to be critical. So when the question says, this is what we have done, the answer is very rarely, when you're commenting on that treatment, the answer is very, 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 very rarely, oh, the correct accounting treatment has been done, everything is fine, there are no ethical issues, isn't everybody happy, da 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 the, 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 um, the reality is that Although the examiner is making deliberate mistakes in the question, you know, in his answer, that they're setting out the correct treatment and your answer has to set out the correct treatment. So if I am told in a question that the financial instrument issued to raise finances have been classified as equity, I'm going to say, really? Really? Is that the case? Because everybody wants a financial instrument to be classified as equity. Because if it's classified as equity, gearing goes down. If it's classified as equity, you haven't got the finance costs. If it's classified as equity, it's beautiful. But if it's classified as debt, it, it sort of becomes a bit ugly, doesn't it? Because gearing goes up, you've got a finance cost. So my cynicism tells me, my cynicism tells me that if I am told in a question, a financial instrument has been issued to raise finance and is shown to be equity, then um, it could well be dead. It could well be dead. So I just want you to develop that awareness. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, that was that, was that point there. Okay. One mark at a time. One mark at a time. What do I mean by this? I assume you've read the marking guides. There are people paid a lot of money who put a lot of effort into making sure the marking guides are as clear and detailed as possible. And when you look at the marking guides, you tend to see that there is one mark available for each valid point. So the markers are generally awarding you one mark, one mark, one mark, one mark. And if you can get into that mentality, of how an examiner marks, then I help you 
in the way that you present your answer, the way that you tailor the length of time that you spend on the question, and the way that you think about how you write or whether you number crunch. So marking guides are very important, reflective. You've got to plan your answer. And if a question relates to a particular situation and it's, say, worth five marks, then perhaps you've got identification, yeah, with definition, you've got to apply, discuss, apply, and then come to a conclusion. So think about how you structure it. Everybody, okay, everybody in September is doing computer-based exams in the UK. Now, I know it's been explained to you, things are moving over to CBE for you guys later on. Um, so with the exception of Australia, Australia is CBE in September, but for Malaysia and Singapore and everywhere else in the region, it's paper-based this time. Um, when you come to move to CBE, there is a process of change. Change is always a little bit awkward, but there is a benefit from a marker's perspective in that we won't have to read your handwriting. And there's a benefit from your perspective is that you're able to edit your answer. You've got to plan, in a handwritten paper, you've got to plan. You can't just start writing because you've got to say, hang on a minute. If it's worth five marks, I'm going to try and say five things. And you need to write in small mini paragraphs, please. I like white space. When I'm marking a script, if I've got a whole page of numbers, if, sorry, if I've got a whole page of words, it turns me off. I need to have what you think is worth one mark, what you think is worth one mark, paragraph, space, paragraph, space, may even be a sentence right? Space. Yeah. So you're challenging me. It makes your answer look longer too. All right. If you've got a little bit of white space, it's better presented. And it means that if you want to cross something out, you're just crossing off one little bit, not, not sort of in the middle. So please plan so that you don't, because you can't edit your answer. So please plan to use those mini paragraphs. Right. Have a read. Have a read. There are various indicators of impairment. Some are external, market values declined, or there's an increase in interest rates. Some are internal, when the asset is idle, or even damaged. An asset is impaired when the carrying value of an asset exceeds the recoverable amount. The recoverable amount is the higher of the value in use and the fair value less cost to sell. The fair value is determined in accordance with IFRS 13. The value in use is the present value of the future cash flow. The discount rate to use is the current market risk-free rate of interest. Fantastic. This answer is absolutely technically correct. I love it. But there's a second answer here. There's a second answer here. And I'd like you to read the second answer. Which one do you prefer? Which one is the better one? A or B? Which one do you prefer? The second one, A or B? Eliza, thank you. Lily, thank you. Annabelle, thank you. Melvin, thank you. Joanne, thank you. Maybe I am preaching to the converted. But let me tell you, time and time again, 
the markers come across an answer like A. Because what somebody has done is they have swallowed Google. They've swallowed their tutor's notes. And then they have gone Bleh! all over the page and just regurgitated a definition. And that's not answering the question. That is not explaining. That is not strategic professional. That is not what we're after in SBR. A, and nobody said A. About one, one or two of you might have thought A. I mean, there are some A people out there, all right? And I want you to become artists. I want you to become libertarians. I want you to become creative. I want you to use your own words. The answer, the alternative explanation is the one that you, is the sort of thing that you want to be putting in the exam, left, right, and center. Because it's softened that Fido's machine was damaged is an indicator of impairment that explains what you're doing. Be written down to the recoverable amount, be charted, it's explained. And do you know what? There's two paragraphs as well, isn't there? That's another thing I like. And I like the casual English. The recoverable of FIDO's machine is the higher of what FIDO could sell the asset for and the present value of the cash flows it could generate from keeping it. So it's demonstrating that you genuinely understand what is meant by the recoverable amount, what is meant by the impairment review. All right. So look at your work, look at your mock exams, look at what you do and make sure that you are not this parrot make sure you're not an A type answer, make sure that you are applying and earning the marks and you're a B type, you're an application, application, application. We're still talking about exam technique um, and uh, I sometimes dream. Sometimes dream that I can control time so that I could give my students four hours, five hours, six hours to do the exam. Ask yourself, if you had six hours to do the exam, would you still pass? Yeah, would you, would you, would, would you feel confident of passing if you had all that time? Because I'd like to think the answer is yes. Because if you've got, when you get to the stage of saying to yourself, I've got enough knowledge to pass, I know enough, it's just I'm running out of time, then the thing to, if you like, concentrate on is this exam technique of practicing and getting quicker. You have to have the knowledge first but I'm assuming you've studied. I'm assuming you're with a, an approved learning provider. Um, some of you may be with me. Um, I do online courses. Um, how to improve your time management. Do questions at time. Know how long you should be spending doing questions. So I take, I ignore the 15 minutes, think of that as some kind of safety net. So I think three hours, that's 180 minutes, 100 marks. So 10, uh, if it's for 10 marks, it's for 18 minutes, something like that. And I, I rigorously encourage you to move on because you've got to do exam questions to time. And if you're squeezing the juice out of an orange, if you're squeezing the juice out of a lemon, after you've got most of it out, not a lot more comes out. But you actually, if you get another melon, another orange, and you just give it one quick turn, you get more than you get out of the fourth or fifth squeeze. So you move on to the next question, please. You move on to the next question. I've said the same thing three times. Do exam questions to time. Do exam questions to time. Do exam questions to time. COVID-19 has really messed up so many things. I don't want to be disrespectful to anyone's circumstances or health or anything like that by talking about COVID-19 in any great detail because it's affected everybody and in so many different ways. But the Premiership football has now come back, but it didn't come back straight away. 
they actually had to play practice games. They didn't just say, right, okay, let's start playing tomorrow. It's they had to get fit. And then they practiced playing a 90 minute game behind closed doors. Yeah. Some teams even played each other. I think Spurs and anyway, whatever. Let's not let's not get into the detail of it. You're only going to be properly prepared to do this exam if you've done exam questions to time. And you know, that's something I passionately believe in. That's something I provide my students with and a marking service too, so that you get feedback. Ideally, ideally, not only do you do questions to time, but you get them marked. So you get someone else giving you some constructive criticism and feedback, feed forward on the things that you've done well and the things that you need to do again. And part of that process is you understanding how well you've performed. All right, so please, yeah, please do exam questions to time. Right, I'm not, I'm not gonna go away, but I'm just indicating that we're kind of halfway through and that there are two main things that I was achieving here today. One is to talk about exam technique and stuff, and the other is to talk about the framework. And um, I'm just marking this screen here. So I'm just gonna have a moment and you can have a moment. So this is a two, three minute break of uh, concentration. So if you did need to uh, stand up and stretch, if you did need to go to the toilet or check your Facebook or whatever, uh, now is the time to do so. Now is the time to do so, yeah. Or maybe now is the time to quickly go on LinkedIn. If you have a LinkedIn account, then I have a LinkedIn account and we can connect with each other on LinkedIn because I post regularly all about SBR. And so if you're serious about passing SBR and uh, you just want a little bit of extra information, uh, please um, connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, take it from there. You'll see I've got a series of small sort of blogs and posts and stuff um, that you've got free access to. Chang, yes, you've missed some earlier part of the session. Uh, it is going to be recorded. It is being recorded. And um, my colleagues at ACCA will be circulating you links to any recording. Right, let me just take a time check. And we have an hour and a half left. Yeah, an hour and 40 minutes left, something like that. Okay, I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk about the conceptual framework. It's a little bit of a mugs game to tip, but you know and I know that question one will be on groups, that question two will cover ethics. And if you want a tip beyond that, that is definitely gonna come up, it's the framework, because everything relates to the framework, <laughs> um, as we're about to see. And it's still effectively a current issue, it's still effectively a current issue, it always seems to be there. And as I was saying earlier, a little bit like related parties, you may not see it aggressively flagged up in the question, um, but it, it, it appears in the answer, or it appears in your thoughts. So, um, okay, so let me start at the beginning and start fairly quickly to talk about what the framework is. Um, the framework is theory. The framework is not an accounting standard. The framework is the beginning. In the beginning was the word. And the word was the framework. <laughs> so it's a foundation, it's a base on which the accounting standards are built. It's a series of ideas, a series of values, a series of principles. And in a way it's like a constitution because when accounting standards are being written, 
they're going to be written in accordance with the framework, in accordance with the constitution. So to that extent, you can also think of the framework as a map that points to the future, the way we're going to go, because it's an influential document in the way that it defines assets, defines liabilities, sets out useful information. That's going to have a, an influence on future accounting standards, which is why it's such a current issue and always comes up. But it is very heavy. It is very theoretical. It's not practical. And if you have a conflict between what the theory says in the framework and what an actual specific accounting standard says, then I'm afraid you always follow what the specific accounting standard says. Now, the benefits of having a framework is that we have a thought through um, coherent approach to accounting standards um, and that we're able to solve problems in the absence of an accounting standard. There is no accounting standard on Bitcoin but it's come up in the exam. There is no accounting standard on, on uh, crowdfunding, but I believe it will come up in the exam. Crowdfunding. And, and how do you account for crowdfunding? How do you account for something when you don't know what the accounting standard is gonna say? Well, you're gonna have to think, and you're gonna have to use the language, you're gonna have to use the principles, the core values, of the framework to come up with an accounting treatment that you think the ISAB would come up with, but they're a slow beast. It takes them several years to catch up. And, you know, we don't want to have over-regulation. Uh, we want to have a principles-based approach and the framework is that principles-based approach. By having a principles-based approach, we should reduce creative accounting and we should be we should also contri it also contributes to communication. If I'm honest, I think it's very unlikely that you're going to be asked directly what is the nature of and what are the benefits of the framework. I, I, you know, it, it, it's not an academic academic exam, it's a practical exam. But I wanted just to kind of cover that. Um, now, why was it revised? It was fairly recently revised and it was revised to make it bigger and better. Bigger in the sense that there are new chapters. Now clearly those new chapters are more examinable. They're the current issues. Measurement, cost or value, presentation, P&L, OCI, recycling. We're going to have a look at those. Yeah, and we're going to have a look at those. I'm going to focus on those areas, all right? Because the, there are new chapters. We're also making it up to date, changing some little areas here or there, which are slightly less important or less sexy to me anyway. Okay. Rightly or wrongly, you need to rote learn you need to know this definition it's it's key an asset is a present economic resource that you control as a result of past events and an economic resource is the right is a right that has the potential to produce economic benefits now back in the day the word was probable probable flow so we're now talking about the potential for economic benefit so it's probably a slightly looser definition which may result in more assets being recognized when it's relevant to do so if we can faithfully represent them ACCA produce a set of accounts. Do you think the examiner appears as an asset on the financial statements of the ACCA? You work for somebody, maybe you work for a hospital, maybe you work for a charity, maybe you work for an accountancy firm. Do you appear as an asset of the business? 
lots of people are saying no. Tabitha says no. Yeah, Ilya says no. And you are correct. If I am an accountant, I have to say that staff are not assets of the business. And yet, do you know, I hope you have an annual review, probably over Zoom these days. But in giving an annual review to your staff, I hope you say to your staff, you're an asset to the company. I hope when your manager gives you an annual review, they say to you, you're an asset of the company. But they're saying it in a colloquial sense, you understand. They're not saying it in a technical accounting sense. And I really like the fact that so many of you, Chang just now, for example, has said the reason, and it comes down to control. Okay? The definition of an asset is based around control. Now, in debating whether or not the staff are an asset of the company, this could be worth three, four marks. You've, you've got to come up with more than just the conclusion. So explaining the definition. Now, I would argue that some staff do have the potential to produce economic benefits. I would argue that, that if you're a salesperson, if you're a, a high profile lecturer, if you're a um, a banker who's got special expertise, if you're a software engineer, there are certain roles where potentially, potentially, some staff clearly produce economic benefits, either from higher revenues or from cost savings, either or both, either are economic benefits. But as has already been pointed out, you cannot control staff in the way that you control a chair. If you have a piece of office furniture, you can uh, make that office furniture work 24, hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sits in the office. If you want to move that office, if you want to move that piece of furniture to Hong Kong or to London, you just pick it up and you move it, you control it. If you want to throw it away, you just throw it away. You can't do that with staff. You can't make staff work 24 seven. You can't just scrap staff. They have employment rights. You don't control staff in the same way. A chair can never resign. Staff can. A chair never goes sick. Staff can. So it, it, it's a very, very different form of relationship. Yeah. So as a result, staff are not recorded in the financial accounts. This is SBR. We've got to also be aware that not everybody agrees with that philosophical point. Because in a knowledge economy, it is the staff that are the business. And I would argue from a philosophical point of view the fact that we are not recognizing our highly trained staff as assets of the business means that there's a, uh, a lack of accountability, that the financial statements are somehow incomplete and they're not faithful. It's a shame that we can't recognize staff, some staff on the balance sheet. It means that our balance sheet somehow is incomplete and there's a lack of accountability as to how well we're managing our staff. So if all of our key staff leave, there doesn't seem to be any depression in the, in, in the assets of the company. And if we've trained up and recruited some fantastic staff, again, the balance sheet doesn't get any bigger or better. And in a way, I think that's a shame. And maybe, just maybe, this could be an area where we uh, reference integrated reporting because integrated reporting identifies human resources as a capital. And, and therefore introduces some accountability for that. So you can produce an answer which is more than just yes or no. You can produce an answer which discusses, even though you're clear as to what the conclusion is. If it's worth four marks, you're not going to get an you're not going to get the marks if you simply say staff cannot be shown as assets on the balance sheet. That's not an answer. 
zero marks because you haven't justified it, you haven't explained it, you haven't discussed it. And the requirement would always require that discussion. I'm not an asset on the balance sheet. You're not an asset on the balance sheet. But there are one or two people who are assets on the balance sheet. There are There is a type of business which does show staff as assets on the balance sheet. I wonder if anybody is capable of lateral thinking. Maggie says athletes. What type of athletes, Maggie? What type of athletes? Oh, yes. Basketball players, football players, sports players. Yes. Now this, we've got to be a little bit careful. We don't get too carried away because, you know, uh, there is a lot I could talk about here. There's a lot I could talk about here. But if we take, for example, Manchester United, which may be a football club many of you have heard of. It's not one I support, but it's, it's a team that I think is, is fairly well known. Um, Manchester United recently bought Harry Maguire from Leicester. And I don't know exactly what they paid, but let's say they paid 50 million. All right. If you are Manchester United, you have credited cash 50 million. So that's not wages for Harry Maguire. They have bought Harry Maguire, or if I'm being technically correct, they've bought his registration, they've bought his contract, so they've bought an intangible asset. So they credit cash and debit Harry Maguire, they debit an intangible asset, that's what Manchester United do. And then because he's on a five-year contract and because of the Bosman ruling, and because he will be a free agent at the end of five years, released from his contract, they then amortize, they then systematically write off that 50 million through the PL. So the argument is that they do have an element of control because uh, 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 the player can't play for another club, the player can't go skiing, the player can't resign. There's a sort of process around making sure that that player has the right diet. There's all sorts of control issues there, which we just don't get in our contracts. And they have economic benefits because they could be sold on. There's image rights, etc. So it is true that uh, sports people, basketball players, footballers, can be included as intangible assets. Key management personnel? No, no, Alvin. I don't see that. So colloquially, I think they are assets. Colloquially, I think it, it, it's useful that we disclose something about those people in terms of um, integrated reporting. But in terms of do we have them as assets in the business? No, no, because we haven't got a monetary transaction to underpin it. Um, so we haven't got a way of faithfully representing it. It's not relevant. So it's the same, you know, um, key management personnel, no, artists, no. What I would say about footballers, and, and this now depends upon a little bit of knowledge uh, about Manchester United, but if I think about Ryan Giggs, if I think about David Beckham, if I think about Paul Scholes um, for Manchester United, if I think about... Um, Harry Kane for Spurs, these players have never been bought. They have simply come up through the ranks and therefore there's no monetary transactions that are uh, underpinning the transactions. So homegrown players are not regarded as assets on the balance sheet. So the answer to Prem's question is that uh, non-executive directors, chief executive officers, there is no purchase of their contract. There's no payment to buy them from their previous employer. There's no control. Those people can still resign. I am unaware. I am unaware of any of any company which shows its directors as assets of the company on the balance sheet. It's simply not not the case, and it would be uh, I think outrageous. I think it would be inappropriate to be claiming. Um, that they are assets of the companies. In fact, if I'm not 
if I'm being slightly flippant, some of them are liabilities, aren't they? Let's be honest about it. Okay. Talking of liabilities. Talking of liabilities. Um, we've got here the elements. Yeah. So we know what a liability is. And I would like you to uh, have a think about this transaction. Maybe you've got pen and paper. Maybe you want to write something down about this. I don't know. Maybe you want to do a screenshot. I don't know. I don't care. But I want to talk about this transaction for five minutes. I want to really make sure that you understand what is happening here. So various people have already come up with a statement. I suppose the question I'd like to ask first of all is yes or no. The director has de-recognized the asset and reported a profit of five. Is that right or wrong? Do we think the director is yes, correct? Or do we think the director is wrong? April, Afak, Zian, Chang, I love you all. Fantastic, fantastic, lovely. Yeah, maybe I can cut through this like a knife through butter. Those of you who are your keyboard warriors, those of you who are articulating to me, are telling me it's wrong, and it is wrong. But in the exam, we've also got a, uh, so, so that's good cynicism, yeah? And some of you are, are referring, now there's no, there's no reference to lease back, um, but I do like the idea that some people are coming up with the, the idea of substance and principles and loans. So let me whiz through some of this. The land has a value of 100. It's carried at a cost of 55. That's allowed. Even if it's an investment property, PPE, you have a choice as to whether you have the asset cost or value. You have a choice. Now we're selling it, so it's perfectly legit to have the asset in the books at 55. Now you're selling it for 60. Selling it, I suppose, means you're passing legal title. Now, the first thing that occurs to me is this smells because we're selling it for 60 when it's worth 100. And I don't like that. That makes me suspicious. Secondly, there's a call option, and we have to understand what a call option is. An option is a choice. If it's a call option, it means me, the seller, is able to call the asset back. I am in control of calling. I have sold the asset, and I have an option to call it back. So it's the seller who has the choice whether to repurchase the asset for 66. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. If you've got the choice to buy something for 66 in a year's time, which is worth 100, there's no choice at all. <laughs> it's not really a choice. It's not really an option. Because if we've got the ability to buy it for 66 and it's worth 100, Every single one of us will buy it. So it's not like, oh, maybe we will, maybe we won't. It's a choice. It's absolutely the case that we will pay the money back. That we receive 60 million today and we will buy the asset back again in a year's time. We receive the 60 million today and paying back 66 means you're paying back 60 last 10% interest. 
The reason you have received the money is because it's a loan. So the choice is clear. Yeah, this first choice is the wrong treatment, wrong treatment. It's the second choice that is true. It's the second choice that is true because assets are not normally sold at under value. The seller is retaining the economic benefits through the option, which fixes the price at which they can buy the asset back. If the value of the land goes to 105, the seller benefits. If the value falls to 95, the seller benefits. The seller still got the risk and rewards, got access to the economic benefits. There's an economic certainty that the option will be exercised because everybody will buy it for 66 if it's worth 100. So the truth is, the faithful representation is, it's a loan and it's not a sale. It's a loan, it's not a sale. And again, there's another clue there that when you're paying the money out again, you've got uh, an interest rate of 10% of finance costs of 10%. Those of you who love journals, those of you who love journals can see the journal entries there. Good. Absolutely, I agree, Ning, yeah. Five marks, six marks, explaining. And, and the answer is based around the core definition of what an asset is, what a, a liability is, when we recognize, when we de-recognize, and there's a few simple numbers there. So it's not an MCQ scenario, it's not a bookkeeping scenario, um, but it's understanding and, and, you know, using the framework to come up with an answer like that. I'm just pausing here for a second. I'm just checking my time. I think we've got another 15 minutes to go. Um, so that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. Good. Chapter six is a new chapter. All right, and what chapter six says is, look, I'm, I'm, I'm from the UK, all right? I'm from the UK, so I can talk about my country um, in a way which is not gonna upset anyone else because I can talk about my country because it is my country. Now, my country is not a communist state and it's not a fascist state. So, for example, uh, I went to school in a state school, but my nieces and nephews, they go to school in a private school. So when you're ill, sometimes people in the UK go to a national health service, a government hospital, but at the same time, we've also got a private healthcare system. So we're not exclusively a government economy. We're not exclusively a state communist system. Neither are we exclusively 100% free market economy either, in that we do have a government that intervenes in the market and provides certain things. And there's always a political debate about where that line should be drawn. And it's that analogy that I think about whether we measure things at cost or whether we measure things at value, because there is a little bit of blending and argument and debate about where exactly to draw the line. And let me give away a punchline here. In the UK, the UK is a mixed economy. The UK is a sort of social democracy. The UK has government and private sector side by side. And in financial reporting, we have cost and we have value side by side. They, they coexist. And that is a mixed measurement system. But this chapter is brand new. All of the accounting standards have not been built on this chapter because this was only introduced last year. And so this is really the definitive guidance that we now have about measurement. So what is cost? Cost is basically the price that you paid, but cost does move because cost moves with impairment, cost moves with depreciation, cost moves with amortized cost. So cost is to a certain extent kept up to date. What do we mean by value? And that is an enormous question. 
but value is often regarded as fair value which is exit value, the price that you would expect to pay. But you'll recognize the phrase value in use, which is used sometimes uh, particularly for impairment, uh, particularly for impairment. So don't worry too much about current cost. There's not really a lot of accounting standards which concentrate on current cost. So there are two areas there of cost and value. Value is up to date, value is fresh, yeah? Now, what the framework says is going forward that we should determine whether an asset or liability should be measured at cost or value on a case by case basis. And we'll come up with different conclusions. So it's a mixed measurement system. Now, cost is very much our traditional basis. Yeah, cost is very much our traditional basis. And traditionally, it's regarded as objective because you've paid for it. Traditionally, it's regarded as reliable because it's underpinned by a transaction. And traditionally, it's regarded as being out of date because it's backward looking, it's what you've paid for it. But I think I've already said that it's updated by impairment, depreciation, amortized costs. So maybe it's not as, as negative and old fashioned as you might think. And maybe that, that updating creates some uncertainty and of subjectivity. Now, if you believe in useful information, you want information to be useful, it has to be relevant. And relevant information is predictive and forward looking. So fans of value are, 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 are loving, uh, fans of useful information, relevant information are loving value because it is predicting basically what you could sell an asset for and that's predicting the future cash flow. But if you're never gonna sell the asset, there is a strong argument which says you shouldn't use value. Amortized financial assets that have passed the cash flow test, financial assets which are um, um, solely the payment of principal and interest, where the business model is that you are never going to sell the asset, IFRS 9 says that must be at amortized cost because no one cares what the asset is worth because it's never going to be sold. I mean, it, it's like a, a photocopier in an office. It's never going to be sold. So why bother having it at value? Whereas things like derivatives, oh my God, derivatives must be at value because they have no cost, otherwise they'd be invisible. So it's a case by case basis. And, and, and the framework gives this guidance. The framework is, is helping us. Yeah, it, it, it helps us. And what the framework says, is that we've got to use our common sense. The framework cannot tell us what to do. Our parents cannot tell us what to do every minute of every day. They have to instill us, have to instill in our certain core values and principles so that when we come across new challenges in our lives, then we do the right thing. And what the key words for the framework is always relevant, predictive, forward-looking, confirmatory, relevant, makes a difference to the decision-making process. Yeah, faithful representation, about being complete. You know this, yeah, error-free, substance over form, faithfully representing. And these are some of the factors, these are some of the factors that you would take into account in arriving at whether or not something was to be taken at cost or value. And it may well be that you've seen this before. It's quite a lot of detail, um, but if you look at the characteristics of an asset, if you've got variable cash flows, if it's sensitive to market value, like derivatives, yeah, you would have it at value. Whereas effectively, if the asset is part of a team and is never gonna be sold, you would effectively have it at cost. So yeah, I'm not going to spend too long on that slide. Sheep, lambs, yeah, sheep, lambs. I know maybe I could have used chickens 
somehow chickens seem less material. A sheep is kind of a bit more of a chunky thing. Now, you may know the answer to this from I say 41, but actually, even if you can't remember, and even if you've never studied that particular accounting standard, and I don't blame you if you haven't, it is after all a fairly obscure standard, agriculture. It's not mainstream. What is the most useful way for a farmer who breeds sheep? What's the most useful way of them measuring the asset of sheep? Do you think it is cost? Or do you think it is value? Please, far away. Ruha says value, Sophie says value, Nina says value. Ilya says value. Tabitha says value. Jeremy and Annabelle. Jeremy says cost. Ho Ching Yung says cost. Hardip says it's infantry. Oh, now that's a separate question, Hardip. Let's come back to that in a minute as to whether we think it's infantry or not. Let's come back to that. That's a different uh, question. Fair value until it's harvested. Oh, um, do we harvest sheep? Is that the right terminology? I don't know. Don't know. Um, fair value wants its harvest, but I don't know. Right, we'll, we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. I think for me, I agree with the majority of you. Um, because I think it's most useful to have those sheep that we've bred at value because the cost is nil. There, there is no cost. And if we record them at cost, there'll be nothing on the balance sheet. I mean, the sheep are just, the lambs are just born. Okay, originally you might have to buy them from a market. So you originally you would know the cost originally. But if you're breeding sheep, it doesn't cost you anything. But, you know, the sheep just just come along. It's not a problem. Um, so it's what the framework would suggest. It's what I say 41 requires, that uh, the sheep would be uh, at value. Yeah, because if you don't include the sheep in the balance sheet, the balance sheet is incomplete. If it's incomplete, it's not showing a faithful representation. By including the sheep at value, you're predicting what the asset could be sold for, so you're being relevant. So it's that word useful that I'm really highlighting on and build, enables you to build an answer. In other words, it's not just knowing, I say 41 says, this is agricultural produce and therefore must be regarded as, a, um, as, a, as, 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 a, as an asset at fair value. It's reasoning and explaining to somebody why you must show lambs on the balance sheet as an asset. They have economic resources, the benefits because of the meat, because of the milk, because of the uh, wool, and because the animal itself can be sold. Now, whether they are infantry or not, I don't know. It depends why you've got them. If you've got them for breeding purposes, if you're keeping a ram for breeding purposes, it's not infantry. If you're keeping sheep for wool and for milk, it, I don't think it's infantry. It's more like PPE because they're an asset which is kept for a long period of time. But if you are trading them, then I guess you know, you're gonna sell them to market you would have them at inventory as I say two, but you wouldn't use the I say two valuation model of lower of cost and net realizable value because that would be nil because the cost is nil. So you would have them at inventory, but you would have them under I say 41 and you'd have them at fair value. So <laughs> it's just another little example how the framework can come up with an answer. And it, it, there's an engagement in the process around you know, I say 41, I say two, but you don't need, need, need to kind of have that rote learning of everything in order to be able to work out the answer if you understand the framework. So, Hadi, 
that's a great point that you made and I appreciate that and I hope that discussion has been beneficial. So it's value every time, partly because of what I've said and I've justified that. I mean, it's what the standard requires, I say 41, but that's not what you need to write and explain to a farmer to explain to your client uh, as is the case. Right, uh, it's coming up for, it's coming up for uh, the end and I haven't finished as much as I would like to do. I know I've got a four hour session with you guys uh, coming up. So um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to wrap up in about five minutes if that's okay. And then there's a little bit about um, recycling and OCI that I'll deal with at the beginning of the next session. So we've got a four hour session next, uh, next week. Uh, which I'm looking forward to. So yeah, I've got another five minutes though, and then I'll hand over to Ryan to do some concluding comments, but not for now, but just five more minutes if that's okay. So by way of observation, we do have um, different standards giving us different rules. So there's a mandatory lower of cost and NRV under ISA 2. There's a choice for PPE. There's a choice for investment property. And sometimes we have a mandatory valuation on derivatives, for example. Sometimes you have a mandatory cost on um, uh, business uh, financial assets, which have met the business cash flow test. Only principal payments of interest, uh, payments of uh, repayments of principal and interest, and have met the, the business model. So, so of, of never selling. So it's a right mess. It's a right mess. We have a mixed measurement system. The balance sheet is not made up of everything at cost, and the balance sheet is not made up of everything at value. It's a mixed measurement system. It's one of the reasons why when you add up the balance sheet, the total of the balance sheet from one perspective is meaningless. It doesn't represent what the business is worth. Somebody, some, sometimes we criticize capital employed because it, it, it's because of the mixed measurement system. It's, it's one of the reasons that breeds alternative performance measures, for example. And I think I'm going to leave it there because it's a very good cutoff point because I don't want to rush things. And uh, when I resume again, uh, I will be... Um, resuming looking at uh, the presentation here, uh, looking at chapter seven. So yeah, I've still got a little bit of a way to go. Um, but what I would like to say uh, is that I'm about to hand over to Ryan. Um, we have covered the introduction. We have talked about the SBR exam itself. I've concentrated on exam technique for the first half hour or so. And I, you know, that's very generic and that, that's got a lot of application. I've had a good look at the framework because I really believe that's a really core value. And I do want to come back and finish off the bits on the framework next time. And I've got the next time down as the 18th of August, but Ryan's going to make sure that you're communicated with that and you sign up with that. And next time I'll finish off the framework and I'll be revising you on group accounts. I'll be revising you on cash flow. I'll be revising you on financial instruments. And a recording of this session is being made. And I'm sure Ryan will explain how that is going to be circulated. Let me just say one last thing before I hand over to Ryan, which is thank you for listening. If you found it useful, if you want to know a little bit more about SBR, one way of connecting with me and some of the material that I make available for free is through LinkedIn. And so by all means, um, connect with me on LinkedIn. But let me hand over to Ryan now. Hi everyone, uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Ryan, the executive in learning support team ACC Malaysia. Uh, thank you so much, Tom, uh, in uh, conducting these wonderful SBR sessions. I believe that you have enjoyed it with the companion of our engaging students. Uh, thank you so much of you all in attending the, today's sessions. Hopefully, uh, you have gained more insights on the SPR paper. And do stay tuned for our next week's sessions on the exam focus for SBL, SPR, and also APM papers. So for today's uh, recording sessions on the SPR paper, uh, we will be sending uh, you the link to um, for the videos and also the presentation slides in the PDF file.
Uh, just a, a gentle reminder uh, for students who are yet to renew your membership, please do it via your MyC account. Uh, Tom, uh, is there anything you want to add on to our students, especially for those who are attending their exam in these up, um, upcoming September sessions? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the ACCA are providing everybody with uh, a lot of resources and I would, uh, I would encourage them to take advantage of those resources. So um, I know that we have another session coming up and that's going to be a much longer session. So I will be able to cover more detail. And I'm going to use that session to concentrate on, again, the core things that tend to come up in the SPR exam. Obviously, I, I haven't seen the exam. You know, I don't know for sure exactly what's coming up, but I've read the examiner's reports. I've looked at the previous papers. There are certain core areas, and that's why I concentrated on um, uh, the framework today. And, and my beginning bit was informed very much from feedback from the examiner about you know areas that that students who are marginal need to improve now you know honestly ryan i was impressed with the the keyboard warriors <laughs> who were responding to me and and help helped make the session very interactive yep. so i thank them for their participation um, and i look forward to uh, next time session and i look forward to connecting with some of the students perhaps on linkedin as well definitely yeah. So, uh, all students, uh, this is not the end of our regional student virtual conference. Uh, we still have two more days to go. Uh, do join us in the sessions tomorrow and the day after. See you guys there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank yeah, you, everybody. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Have you some too. food for me. <laughs> have some seafood.